welcome to week two of the Linux architecture uh, lecture. I'm Zach Roof from securingthestack.com. Super uh, excited to have you back. And essentially where we left off last week was we were talking about different processor modes. Uh, you, you can kind of think of, you know, uh, of, of the privileges that um, code is allowed to execute in. Um, so we looked at kernel mode and user mode, okay? And essentially, protection rings that we're going to you're, you're looking at right here as a diagram of them are essentially a way of visualizing that and but it also talks about a little bit more so let's go ahead and start off with this so protection rings in x86 well why what is x86 and you know why do you care uh, so essentially x86 is the most popular processor architecture for desktop computers okay um, and sometimes when you look into the specs of smartphones you'll see um, arm based processors okay and what that essentially is is that uh, arm is the most popular um, kind of processor architecture for mobile devices as it is more uh, efficient efficient with its battery utilization okay um, but as you know desktop computers don't really need that now um, they kind of have a little bit of a of a different architecture one thing that you can kind of see is you see the X in x86 essentially that's just saying um, some numbers with you know x you know six, uh, eight six at the end. Uh, so whenever you see these you know this family of of processors, uh, you'll see many different ones. However, they always end in, in eight six. So that's kind of why that's there. So we can basically kind of going into protection rings a little bit more. We can think of protection rings as a graphical depiction of CPU privilege levels, as I already kind of spoke about, okay? In a follow-up lecture, I'll be diving uh, more into the CPU architecture of how protection rings work uh, and getting pretty pretty low level with it. Uh, it's going to be pretty sweet. Uh, but now let's, let's just kind of uh, look at the basics, okay? Oops. Okay, so CPU's kernel mode, okay, that we've already spoken of spoken about um, that really correlates with ring zero right here okay and CPU's user mode okay all right let's go uh, has to do with ring three okay so you have ring zero for kernel mode and ring three for, for user mode okay so here's here's a little thing because you see this and you're like well what about these other rings what about ring one and ring two well we're going to be diving in. I'm going to be going into that a little bit more in a second. Um, well, essentially, I'll just kind of go into a little uh, brief teaser uh, teaser right now. But uh, essentially, in most cases, modern you know OSs, including Linux, only utilize Ring 0 and Ring 3 uh, in x86 architectures. Uh, essentially because of the way something called a page table is implemented. Uh, and, and this isn't like a sure fast, there's nobody that, that said this is the way it is, that this is the only reason why we use ring zero and ring three, but we're going to be going kind of, um, yeah, essentially a, you know, a, a page table is a, it's a memory mapping file and we're going to be going into that, but there's only really two modes um, of, of kind of, of, of how to describe those memory chunks. Um, and, you know, either it, they can be allowed from the user space or not. So that's kind of why you kind of have this binary. It's either, you know, ring three or ring zero. Anyhow, that doesn't really make a lot of sense right now. That's, that's not, you know, a really big deal just because we're going to be kind of going into this a lot uh, further uh, as, as we kind of uh, progress. But anyhow, um, one, one kind of interesting thing is, is that even though modern uh, architectures can kind of, you know, or x86 can have all of these, yes, as I said, ring zero and ring three are most commonly utilized, but in certain virtualization environments, ring one is actually used, okay? Um, and that's actually VirtualBox, okay? A virtual machine puts the VM's kernel code actually in ring one, okay? And the actual kernel code of the underlying machine um, is in ring zero so it's kind of kind of fascinating but anyhow yeah let's let's keep going here so and, and you know we we already kind of we started to look at this but you know let's 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 get a little bit more so if all processes can start in ring three right as we've already spoken about how do they execute ring zero privileges right because like the kernel that deals with the underlying operating system. Well, if I'm a user application, right, a user process, I'm going to need to sometimes look at the at the file system or do input output things. These are things that are 
essentially, um, you know, restricted to, you know, ring zero privilege or, you know, the kind of kernel privileges. So how does this occur? Okay, and as I said, um, you have, I'm oh, just waiting for that little thing to go away. But anyways, <laughs> okay, cool. You have IO operations, you have file system manipulation, etc. And that is something called the system call interface, right? And that's really kind of the, another, you know, middleman, uh, you know, kind of between the user space, right? Which are those, those items that are executing in ring three, right? And the kernel space executing in ring zero. So kind of the, the, the user space processes um, can kind of implement or can essentially uh, utilize this interface as kind of this kernel API uh, to have the kernel um, invoke some of it if its functions itself. So let's check it out. What is a system call? Okay. So a system call is really a request to the kernel okay, by a user process to perform a privileged action, right? Like a kernel action. Okay. And then there's things called interrupts, right? And then an interrupt is a signal emitted to the CPU that says there's an event that needs your immediate attention, okay? And what's the importance of these interrupts? Well, they can initiate a system call, okay? For example, a software-based interrupt. They have hardware-based interrupts. I mean, there's different variations, but the software-based interrupts are the ones that, you know, are going to be initiating the system calls um, to basically uh, essentially escalate the, the, the privileges that are needed. So here's the thing. Okay, so code on more modern CPU architectures may use another initiation process, okay, instead of the interrupt. But the main process behind everything is the same. And I'll kind of, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a small little nuance, um, but essentially sometimes these interrupts are a little bit more um, kind of uh, intensive, uh, you know, than they need to be. So certain mo more modern CPU architectures kind of, instead of that interrupt step, they kind of have another, another one. So, but anyhow, the underlying idea is the same. That's what's important. Okay, and here I, I kind of allude to it. So, or I, I do show it. So user process, right? So let's let's go through a system call example, okay? So a user process needs to make a system call for a privileged action, okay? So let's start. So a user process needs a kernel action so it so it initiates um, an interrupt, right? Or sysn or six, six, sys exit instruction, okay? Those are the, the more efficient ones that are used on more uh, modern uh, architecture, CPU architectures. Okay, so number two. The interrupt or instruction puts the CPU into ring zero and passes control to the kernel. Okay, the kernel determines if the user process should be granted the system call, okay, based on privileges. And if granted, the kernel will execute the system call because the functions that are actually being invoked, like say, like the, the file manipulation and, you know, or, you know, a lot of that code is actually housed in the kernel. So, um, it, it's kind of this 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 the sharing of, of code in, in a way you can kind of think about it so and once finished the kernel initiates a change to ring three and then the kernel gives back control to the user process sweet so process management well you know what actually I think that this will be a good kind of natural time to, to stop for this week um, and because the process management is going to go a little bit more lengthy uh, or go a little bit further so we'll stop here and uh, looking forward to seeing you next week thank you